glad you decided to join us this Easter Sunday. Come on, let's lift up Jesus together.
Come on, let's testify this morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. His very body began to breathe. And now of the
Come on, church. This morning, let's be found in him. Psalms 91 says, those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We dwell there. We don't visit. We don't come and go. But our hearts and our minds, they dwell in Christ. So this morning, church, let's press in. We're not together, but you're in your homes. You're with your families. As a family, let's press into the Lord during this time more than any other. Come on, let's remember that he's the cornerstone. He's the only foundation that's firm. He's the one we build our lives on. When the storms come, they don't knock us down. Come on, let's press in today, people of God, more than ever. Let's make him the cornerstone of our lives. Come on, let's sing it out today, Christ the Lord. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Motion Church. Thanks so much for joining us online today. My name is Noel, and I am the pastor here. And by the way, happy Easter Sunday morning. I hope you guys are enjoying it with your family. Thanks for joining us. And if you're, you're with us for the first time online, maybe you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your Easter Sunday morning to spend a little less than an hour with us. For, for us, it means so much. That's such a special thing. So thank you. And we wish that we could connect with you in person right now, but we can't because of what's going on. But we'd love to connect with you digitally before then. So if that's you, just drop a comment or DM us. Say, I'm new here. We want to reach out to you, get you plugged in, even before we can meet with you in person. And then Motion Fam, Abby and I miss you guys like crazy. It has been way too long since we've been able to see you guys and hang out in in person as a church family. And so know that we miss you, know that we love you. It's been really cool being able to hang out with some of you you, as you've jumped on our weekly uh, small groups on Zoom. And so if you're interested in getting connected during this COVID-19 time, want to be a part of our weekly small groups, uh, email us, info at motionchurch.org. We'll get you the information on how to get plugged into those things. You know, as we're here at Easter, I think the reality for for myself, for all of us at Motion, for all of the pastors across America, really for every single Christian, we, we wish today 
that we could all be worshiping God together on Easter Sunday. Like we, we wish that we could be in person at our church in that physical location. That, that's just the reality. You know, we wish we could have the, the typical kids Easter egg hunts. We wish we could have the, the typical communion together on Easter Sunday morning. That's, that's kind of where we, we are. It's, it's reality. But can I just encourage you this morning with another reality? Though, though Easter looks different this year, on, on that horrible Friday nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus was crucified. But three days later, he rose from the dead, beating death, hell, and the grave. He won. And though Easter looks different this year, can I just remind you, can I encourage you, Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus hasn't disappeared. He's still Savior. He's still Lord. He's still the leader of our life. And he is still a good God. He's our hope. And because of that, in times like we're facing right now, you and I can still have peace. In fact, I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John chapter 16, verse, verse 33. This is what Jesus says, his very own words. He says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. But he says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus doesn't say we will face hard times, but he did say that we can have peace in him in spite of the trials. And, and for me, for, for you, that's, that's some good news today in a crazy time. So if I can encourage you, hang in there. We, we, we're going to get back to normal. Things are going to reopen. Stores are going to reopen. Haircut places are going to reopen. Can I get an amen on that? Why are haircut places not essential? Like, we, I need haircuts, man. Like, I, I just need a haircuts. This, this past week, I had finally had enough. I get haircut like every two weeks. I, I finally had enough. And so I told my wife, Abby, I said, babe, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm going to cut my own hair. And when I, when I mean I'm going to cut my own hair, it means I'm just going to shave. I'm going to get a four, number four, and just buzz it all off. And she said, Nolan, don't do that because when you do that, you look like an idiot. And I was like, that's kind of rude. But then she said, hey, I'll, I'll cut your hair for you. I'll cut your hair. And I was like, are you sure? And she was like, yeah, I mean, look at your haircut. It's not that difficult. I mean, how, how hard could it really be? It can't be that hard. Well, can I tell you today, it definitely was that hard. Like, if I could just give you a piece of marital advice, if you don't have that strong of a marriage, don't let your spouse cut your hair. Thankfully, my wife and I have a great, healthy marriage, and so I let her cut my hair. It took like an hour, which usually it takes like 10 minutes, it took like an hour. Uh, there was a little bit of tension back and forth and, and trying to figure it out, but we, we made it through, and she did a, she did a pretty decent job. So I, I just say all that to, to say we are going to get through this time. Just, just stay strong, hold your families tight, and press into God. Well, today we are continuing in a teaching series that we've been in over the past several weeks called Hope Against Hope. And at the beginning of this teaching series, I, I kind of made the, the, the idea out there to you that in this time, as your pastor, I would love to be your hope dealer. I, I would love to infuse some hope into your home. And to do that, we've been taking a look at and really studying the life of a guy in the Bible named Abraham. And you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, okay, well, what is looking at this Abraham guy and his life, what, what does that really have to do with me? How is that going to bring me hope? Well, Abraham is known for having just an incredible amount of faith. Just always, he was living a life that was just always faith-filled. And I just believe that if you and I can learn to have faith like Abraham, then our, our hope will rise up because faith is the accelerant for hope. Faith fuels hope. So over the past several weeks, in case you missed it, we've looked at Abraham's journey. You know, it started out with this huge faith-filled decision to leave his homeland and move to a distant place that he knew nothing about because God had called him to. He, he left in faith. We, we talked about the promises that God had made to him about how one day he would be the father of many nations, the father of, of many generations, that, that one day he would have so many descendants 
that they, they would number over the amount of, of sand in the seashore and stars in the sky. So God had promised Abraham all of these really great things. And, and kudos to Abraham, he believed God. He, he trusted that what God said was actually true and it was going to, to happen. He was going to have all these descendants and he was going to have all of these kids. Well, problem was, is that Abraham and his wife Sarah, they were geriatrics. I mean, Abraham was in his 90s. Sarah was in her 80s. And they didn't have any kids. So as an old couple, they were believing for all of these descendants and all of this amazing stuff in the future, but they didn't have kids at that point. So what they were doing is they were believing something that that didn't make really any human logical sense. Having a kid at that age, first off, ooh, you know what I'm saying? Like, follow that train of thought, that's disgusting. But, but second off, that's physically impossible. At that age, a woman can't have a baby. But, but that's what faith is. Faith is believing in God's promises. It's believing, even, even though it doesn't always line up and kind of fall in line with human logic or what what current circumstances say. Faith is saying, God, if you said it, God, if you said it, I'm going to believe it. If you said it, I'm going to trust it. And can I tell you something? God is trustworthy. Friends, today God is worthy of your trust in him. He definitely was for Abraham. We read in the story, God follows through on his promise And when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, they had their promised baby boy, Isaac. Now, let me just stop there for just a moment. I'm 31. My wife, she's 29. And so we have a a two-and-a-half-year-old. And we love our two-and-a-half-year-old. Our boy, he's so so great. He's fun. He's learning to be funny. He's, sometimes he's sour, sometimes he's sweet, like a, like a Sour Patch Kid. What are you going to get? I don't know. But he, he's great. But at, at 31 and 29, e- even our kid can be exhausting, especially in the season of quarantine that we find ourselves in. You know what I'm saying? Like any parents right now, you're with your kid 24-7. You're like, I love you, but you're wearing me out. Please just take a five-hour nap. You know what I'm saying? Like we're all in that place. Kids can be exhausting. But imagine having a child when you're 100 and your spouse is 90. Just imagine that. That, That's that's crazy. Like when your son is two and a half like our son, you're 102 and a half and your wife is 92 and a half. That would be insane. Like that doesn't even make sense. Like who's changing whose diapers? You know what I mean? Is Is the baby changing dad's diapers? It's crazy. How does this even work? All that I do know is that this Isaac kid must have been one loved little dude. I mean, imagine wanting a child your entire life. God God had promised you that you'd have this kid, and then finally at an old age, God came through on your promise. He gave you this this gift of of a child. I I just think about what Isaac must have been like as a kid. I I just got to believe, I got to imagine that Isaac was a spoiled little dude. I mean, he he had to have been spoiled rotten. I mean, when when my parents or my wife's parents come into town, man, my son gets spoiled when they come into town. Like he's eating all kinds of sweets and sugar that he doesn't normally eat at home. He gets anything that he wants They buy him all kinds of things. I'm like, mom and dad, why weren't you like this when I was a kid? Like I wanted a candy bar that was like 50 cents and you said no to that. You're buying like my son $50 toys every time you see him. Like, why didn't you love me like you loved my my son? Like, yeah, that's just kind of what grandparents do, right? Like when my parents are in town and my son will do something that's wrong and I'll punish him. They'll be like, don't, don't punish him. Our, our, Our grandson is perfect. I'm like, no, he's not. But that's what grandparents do, right? They, they spoil. And so Abraham and Sarah were the age of, of great-grandparents, maybe even great-great-grandparents. You know that Isaac was spoiled. And, and I can guarantee you that, that Isaac was very, very protected too. I mean, you wait an entire life for a kid, and then you finally get this, this kid. You're, you're going to make sure that nothing bad happens too. I'm sure that Sarah was the ultimate Helicopter mom. 
And Abraham might have been a helicopter dad as well because they, they, they wanted him so much. So I, I say all of that about their son Isaac to, to set up a time where God tests Abraham's faith in a huge and a significant way. Genesis 22, verse 1, if you have your Bible, turn there. Several years have gone by. Isaac is now a young boy or, or a young teenager. And, and God tells Abraham to do something in faith that just seems crazy. It, it just it doesn't, that's the only way I can describe it. It just seems crazy. Check it out with me. Genesis 22, verse 1 through 2 it says this. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Verse 2, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Like, do you ever read parts of the Bible that you, you, you read it and you think to yourself, what? Why? Like, like, I'm a pastor, I'll admit to you, sometimes I read stuff in the Bible, I'm like, I, I just don't get that, God. Like, that doesn't make sense. Why, why did you do things like that? I just don't, I don't understand it. For, for me, when I'm initially reading this story, it's like a head scratch. You're like, God, what are, you, what are you thinking? You want Abraham to sacrifice his son? This is the kid through which all of the promises we're going to be fulfilled. This is the, the son that Abraham and Sarah had waited for for so many years. And now you want Abraham to go sacrifice him? Like, I'm, I'm going to be real today. If God told me to take my son and to sacrifice him, I'd be like, I'm good. No, I'm, I'm God. I'm, I'm good. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Sorry. Like, you, you lost me at sacrifice my son. But, but check out Abraham's faith and confidence in the fact that God had a bigger plan. The Bible says that the very next day, he didn't take some time to think it over and to, to be like, oh, but I want to do this. No, it says the very next day, Abraham woke up, he got his son Isaac, he got some servants and all of the supplies, and he headed out towards the mountain. They set towards the mountains where God had told him to go. It's just crazy to me. There, there's no back and forth arguing with God. God, I don't want to do this. God, I think this is crazy. God, like, like bartering, there's no bartering where he's like, God, I'll, I'll sacrifice this, 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 and that if you'll keep it from being my son. There's no bartering like I tend to sometimes do. Maybe you sometimes barter with God as well. There's, there's nothing. He just obeys. My, my question is how? Here, here's how I think that Abraham was able to just blindly follow and move forward with God's plans. It's because God's track record encourages faith and trust. You know, for Abraham, he, he had seen God's record of faithfulness over the years, so he was able to follow God's ways without question. Friends, that, that's why it's so important for us to dig into the Bible, to dig into God's word, because we see all of these stories in the Bible where God was faithful, and we learn of his track record, and it builds faith in us. That's, that's why it's so important to, to look back over the years of our life where God has continually been faithful because we see his track record in the past and it builds up faith and trust in us. Can I just tell you something today that's always true? And I'm talking about always true no matter what you're facing. It's the, the truth and the reality that God's ways are the best ways. God's ways are the best ways. Friends, don't, don't try and follow your plans or your ways. God is the only one that can cause all things to work together for the good. I can't, you can't, God can. Even sometimes when human logic tells you to do otherwise, follow God's plans. Because God's ways are the best ways. And, and Abraham, he knew that. So that they, they leave they set up for this place that God had told them to go. They travel for three days. And finally, when they get close to the destination, Abraham tells the servants to, to wait here. And so Isaac and Abraham start walking towards the place, and Isaac is holding the wood on which he would be sacrificed. As they're walking, Isaac kind of starts to wonder what's up, and he asks his dad this question. Genesis 22, verse 7 through 8 says, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. He's, he's curious. 
He says, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Verse 8, Abraham says this, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. Now, we, we've tried to put ourselves in Abraham's shoes. Now, just for a, for a moment, let's, let's put ourselves in, in Isaac's shoes. You've got everything that you need for the sacrifice. You've got the wood, you've got the, the weapon, you've got the, 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 the uh, rope, you've got everything that you need. But you start to think to yourself, what are we actually sacrificing? And then when you say, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Dad says, Hey, don't worry about it, son. God's going God's to provide a sacrifice, an animal for us. And you start to think to yourself, wait, this doesn't add up. Like, if I'm Isaac, I'm thinking this does not add up, right? Like we're, we're just walking through the middle of the, the, the mountains and we're just going to randomly find an animal we can sacrifice. Like, I, I don't know about this. If, if I'm Isaac in this moment, I'm getting a little bit sketched out, right? Like, I, I, Dad, I don't, I don't trust this. I've watched way too many episodes of Dateline in 2020 to trust what you're saying right now. If I were Isaac, here's what I would do. I'd let Abraham, my dad, get in front of me. Remember, Abraham's old. If I were Isaac, I'd let Abraham get a little bit ahead of me, and I would turn, and I would start running. You know what I'm saying? I would start running away as fast as I possibly could because there's no way Abraham is catching Isaac. But what's crazy is Isaac trusted God too. And I I think there's something key, side note, there's there's something key that we can learn from this as as parents. How was young Isaac able to trust God? That that, that God was going to provide a sacrifice even though though there was no one or no one to be found anywhere else? How was he able to trust that God was going to? Here's why. It's because he had parents that were people of faith. Isaac had undoubtedly heard Abraham and and Sarah talking about living a life of faith. Isaac, over the years, had witnessed with his own eyes Abraham and Sarah living out a faith-filled life. And because of that, he had faith. Parents, never underestimate the influence that you have on your child. So Isaac is confident. Abraham is confident. And when they finally get to the place, check out what happens. Genesis 22, verse 9 through 13 it says, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. Just, just imagine this for a moment with me. He, he's willing to do whatever God had asked him to do. He, he has the knife getting ready to, to kill his son. Verse 11, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. For you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up, catch this, and he saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Powerful story of Abraham's faith and the fact that God's ways are the best ways and the fact that at just the right time, God provided. God showed up. Abraham just had to have faith and trust that God was going to follow up on his end of the bargain. Now, you may be sitting there in your living room today watching this, thinking to yourself, Nolan, that's a, that's a great story. It's, that's cool for Abraham and Isaac, but, but today's Easter Sunday. Like, hey, bro, just a memo to you. You might, you might want to talk about Jesus and God, not Abraham and Isaac. What, what, is, what does Abraham and Isaac have to do with Jesus and God and Easter? And it's crazy because actually their, their two stories are, are more similar than we, we really think and kind of lean into. You know, Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac is foreshadowing of God sending his son to this world only to be killed as a sacrifice for the sins of of humanity. In fact, there there are so many parallels in this story that it's kind of crazy. Isaac's birth was miraculous. His mom was 90 years old. That's, That's physically impossible, but God allowed her to have a baby. Jesus Mom, his birth was miraculous because she was a virgin and God conceived the baby through the Holy Spirit in her womb. 
Isaac was Abraham's one and only son. Jesus is referred to as God's one and only son in John 3, 16. Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice on his back. Jesus carried the wooden cross, which he was going to be killed on. Isaac traveled three days to the place of sacrifice. Jesus spent three days in the tomb. Isaac was going to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. Jesus was sacrificed on, at Golgotha, which is at Mount Moriah. Isaac willingly submitted to his father. Jesus willingly submitted to his heavenly father. But, but here's where their, their stories differ. For, for Isaac, God provided a substitute. Isaac was never intended to be sacrificed. For Jesus, him being the sacrifice was God's plan for humanity and for this world from the very beginning. He was the only way. He was the sacrificial lamb. That's why John the Baptist referred to him as the lamb of God. We see it in John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in friends, because of what Jesus did for you and for me, because of the sacrifice that he, he willingly made going to death for us, he's taken away our sin. You see, on, on Friday, death thought it had won. Sa- Satan thought he had the victory. When they took Jesus' lifeless body off the cross, Satan was probably laughing. As they wrapped his body in grave linens and grave cloths, I guarantee you all of heaven was throwing a party and they were ecstatic and they were excited. But early on Sunday morning, the book of Matthew says that there was a great earthquake that took place and the stone was rolled away. And when the women got to the place of the tomb, there's an angel that said, I know you're looking for Jesus, but Jesus isn't here for he has risen. That's powerful, friends. He has risen and he conquered death, hell, in the grave. And on Easter Sunday morning, I just want us to to hone in on this reality. Jesus took all of the sins of humanity on his shoulders, on his back. That's why just before he breathed his last breath, he, he made this statement, this he said this thing. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, why did he say that? It's because in that moment, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, had just become a reality. So what that passage says, it says, God made him, talking about Jesus, God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God had placed the sins of the world on Jesus. And you see, what happens is sin separates humanity from God because God is, is perfect. God is, is he's, a, he's a just God, and because he's perfect and because he's just, he can't have relationship with such imperfect people like you and me. So when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't using the term forsaken like we're, we're accustomed to using it. He wasn't saying it like that. Because Jesus was doing exactly what God had asked him to do. Jesus said that because at this moment, the full weight of humanity's sin was placed on Jesus. And God the Father had no choice than to look away from his son. Because his son now had the world's sin upon him. And in that moment, Jesus was feeling the weight of separation from the presence of God. And just think about this. God abandoned his own so he doesn't have to abandon us. Because Jesus, because God turned his back on his son, he never has to turn his back on you. He was crucified, but three days later, he was raised from the dead. And because of what Jesus did for us, that that very first Easter, nearly 2,000 years ago, you and I can have relationship with with the heavenly father, with a loving God. That's what Easter is all about. A loving father and a loving and willing son. And today, if you're watching this and 
you are a Christ follower, man, we should be thankful to God every single day. But I, I think especially on Easter Sunday, as we commemorate the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we should be extra thankful for what God did for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for your willingness. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient to the Father. We should be extra, extra thankful today. But maybe you're watching this video and you're not a Christ follower. And as you're, you're watching it, you're like, I don't have God as the leader of my life. He's not my, my savior, my, my boss, my, my CEO. If that's you, man, I can't think of a better Sunday than to make the decision to put Jesus in the number one spot in your life and to offer that, that free gift that he gives you. The Bible says that to make that happen, you gotta do two things and it's actually really simple. Jesus doesn't overcomplicate this. He says you gotta, number one, confess and then number two, you gotta believe. Confess that Jesus is Lord and then believe that God raised him from the dead and then you're saved. It's not, it's not something that you do. You can't earn God's love. It's a free gift that God gives to you through faith. And, and today, if you wanna make that decision to accept Jesus as the leader of your life, best decision you'll ever make, if that's you, Man, confess, believe. What I want you to do is email us. We want to celebrate with you, but then email us, info at motionchurch.org. We want to give you the next steps in, of how you can follow after God and his plans for your life. Well, we're going to finish today's service by taking communion as a church family. And you might be watching and thinking to yourself, I don't have at home the typical crackers and juice that we take in church. And listen, that, that's totally fine. What you, what you have is not what's important. So if you have Diet Coke, and Doritos, that's cool. We're in San Antonio. You could have a tortilla and Big Red. That's totally fine. It's all good. Just find something. What, what, what is important, what, what's important for us is remembering what Jesus did in the symbolism of the two sacraments that we're about to take. It represents Jesus' body, which was broken for us, and then Jesus' blood that was shed for us. So if you need to, go ahead, pause the video, go grab some items that you can take this with. It's all good. And you know, even though we can't take communion together in person, at church, physically, as a family, I'm, I'm very thankful today that we're able to connect digitally and still do this as a church body. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says this. It says, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me and take the bread. Verse 25 goes on. It says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and take the cup. Let me pray for us today. God, this Easter Sunday, we thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your willingness. Thank you that you beat death, you beat sin, you took it for us so that we don't have to carry it. And so, Father God, I pray that we would never take advantage of, of your love and your grace. God, we would lean into it. God, we'd have faith that you can save us, you can forgive us, you can wipe our past away because that, that's what you do. You are forgiving, gracious, gracious, grace-filled God. And so today we thank you for the sacrifice you've made. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody listening under the sound of my voice, God, that's, that's teeter-tottering between jumping into faith. Lord, I pray that they would follow you fully. God, I pray that they would commit their life to you today, that you, you save their eternity in heaven with you, and God, give them life here on earth that's fulfilled and filled with purpose. God, we love you. We look to you today. Thank you for what you've done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen and amen. Hey guys, once again, thanks so much for joining us today at Motion Church Online. If you want to connect with us more or if you accepted Christ as the leader of your life today, we want to know about it. Email us info at motionchurch.org. And hey, if you're watching and you need help in any form or fashion, if you need some items, if you need help with whatever it might be, we want to help meet your needs. So please don't hesitate to reach out to let us know. We as a church want to be there for you in this time. 
Hey, I wanna once again thank you guys so much for your continued faithful giving, even in times of crisis like we're facing. It's making a difference. We have two ways right now that you can give. First way, go online, www.motionchurch.org backslash give. You can give there. Or if you like to, you can text any amount to the number on the screen. Well, guys, Easter Sunday, I love you. My wife, Abby, loves you. Our son, Kingston, loves you. We miss you. Have a great Easter, and we'll see you this week in a life group. Love you guys. See you soon.